Our next speaker, we have the pleasure of having Anthony Bennett, partner of Hoffman Baron LLP, who will speak with us on protecting your edge, your intellectual property. Anthony is a partner in the firm's New York office and has experience in a broad range of matters concerning patents, trademarks, and copyrights. His practice includes rendering patent validity and non-infringement opinions and drafting and prosecuting patent applications. Mr. Bennett also has significant experience in trademark matters, which include counseling clients on patent selection, conducting trademark clearance investigations, and prosecuting trademark applications. He also has experience in court appeals across all levels. Prior to earning his law degree, Mr. Bennett worked as an engineer for Grumman Aircraft Systems and Festo Corporation, so he's one of us. Uh, fields of technology include mechanical and electric mechanical arts. Thank you, Larry. Good morning, it's great to be here. Okay. So you've been working hard, spending time, investing your money, maybe other people's money, developing and creating something new, something that gives you an edge over your competition, and something that maybe addresses a need in the marketplace. Your creation may be an invention, creative way of expressing an idea, or a distinctive commercial entity. And that's something that we refer to as intellectual property. Intellectual property essentially is a, it's a creation to the mind. So it is an invention, maybe a literary, an art, um, artistic work, design, a similar name or an image that might be used uh, to distinguish yourself in commerce. Now, the, the law has recognized that these creations are very important and has come up with mechanisms in order to protect them. So, we have such things as patents, trademarks, trade dress, copyrights, and trade secrets. And I'm going to just go over each one of these and kind of show what they are and how they, you can be used to try to protect your, uh, your edge in the marketplace. All right, a patent is essentially a contract between inventors and the government that if, if you as an inventor agree to fully disclose a new idea, to tell the public about it, in, in return you're going to get exclusivity and get rights in that invention and currently it's, you get 20 years from your earliest filing date. Now what exactly does a patent give you? A patent gives you the owner the right to prevent others from making, using, selling, or import, uh, importing a claimed invention. So again, it's the right to exclude others. What it does not give you is the right to practice your claimed invention. <clears throat> so what, what that means, and it's a typical example would be, let's say you have George as a patent. He's an inventor, and he invents a chair. And he claims for that, it's a, the claim of that chair is a flat uh, sitting surface having four legs extending from a bottom surface. All right, so he's got your, your chair, you got your sitting surface, you have four legs. <clears throat> he gets a patent on that. He, now, he has the right to stop others from making someone, from making a, a device that has that sitting surface and the four legs extending from it. Now, Nora comes up and she's working hard and she develops a, an invention that has a flat sitting surface, four legs extending from it, but she comes up with the idea, you know what, if I put curved members on the bottom of each of these legs, I can get my chair to rock back and forth. So Nora's invented the rocking chair. Great, she wants to run out to the market and sells it. There's a problem though. George has the patent on the chair and her rocking chair has all the elements of George's chair. So, Nora has a patent, she's come up with something new, a, a, an innovation, but she can't practice it, because again, a patent is not a right to practice your invention, it's a right to stop others. So, if George wanted to take his chair and put rockers on the bottom, he can't do it, because he'd have to talk to Nora about that, and, and get a license, or buy it from her. And so, Again, that's a, it's a very simple example uh, to, to the basic point of what patent right is giving you. Um, now, it could be, having that second patent, Nora's patent, would be very important because now if Nora wants to get into the chair making business, 
she has something to go to George and bargain with. And perhaps they can cross license. So like, if you let me make chairs, I'll let you make this rocker. And, and they can work out an agreement. Okay, so some basic ideas of a patent. A patent, just keep in mind, it's geographical. So a patent will depend on the country in which it is obtained. A U.S. patent covers, gives you rights in the United States. If you want to get protection in Canada, you'd have to uh, obtain a Canadian application. Uh, and usually each country has its own laws. Europe is one entity where they've come together and they have something called a European patent. So you can get one actual patent and have it validated in all the different uh, European Union countries. So that's it's a very uh, a valuable and cost-effective way of obtaining coverage there. Um, the other thing is if you're an inventor or you're thinking of coming up with an idea, the United States is relatively unique in that there's a one-year grace period prior after when you disclose your invention to when you have to get an application and file. So if there's one thing I can get across with regard to patents that's very important is be careful disclosing your invention because once you disclose it in the United States, the clock starts running. And you have one year, if you don't get your patent on file, you've lost rights. Whatever you've invented is now in the public domain. But more, also very important to keep in mind, most other countries in the world have what's called absolute novelty. Meaning once you disclose it, you've lost it if you don't have a patent application on file. So those are certain things if you're working on uh, ideas that might be in the, the realm of the patent, it's important to keep that uh, in a confidential manner and you know, seek the help of you know, patent attorneys so they can kind of give, guide you of what is disclosure, what's not. That can be, again, that can bar your right to even get a patent. Okay, so let's talk about, there's different types of patents. The one I think we, we generally think of is what we refer to as a utility patent. So that would be a patent directed to a, a device, you know, George's chair, Nora's rocking chair, those are utility patents. It could also be a method, uh, a method for making something, a method for doing something. Software patents would be considered a utility patent. Um, and then there's design patents. Now design patents, they cover the ornamental features of an, uh, of a, of an item. So you could get a, a design patent for, let's say, the tread of a tire. Um, and in other areas, again, it's the way it looks. Um, so a, a design patent, the infringement test there would be, you know, so you get your patent, the drawings are very important there, because you, what you show in your drawing is what you get as far as uh, protection. And it would determine, you look at it and say, would an ordinary observer giving such attention as a purchaser usually gives, regard the two designs substantially the same? So. It's kind of rather narrow protection, but it's a design patent it is not that expensive to get because it's really to the drawings and a little bit of a write-up, and um, it can be very good for preventing knockoffs. If you're making a, a small device, um, that the look of it is, is significant in its commercial success, you believe, uh, a design patent can be a good way. You may also be able to get a utility patent on that. And there's also one other thing with software, graphical user interface, G, uh, GUIs. People are using design patents in order to try to protect those. So um, if you come up with an app and you have little uh, interface, little devices, little buttons that you'd like that are unique to your software, that's something that you can protect through a uh, design patent. The other thing I want to with regard to patent rights, which is important, I think certainly for someone who, uh, who's starting out in the business, and is the ownership rights of it. Ownership is extremely important because if, if it's not nailed down in the beginning, at the end, little you can do to try to correct it. It could be a, a big problem. So let's, let's go through that a bit. Ownership of patent rights initially invests in the inventors. So if you invent something, you're the owner of it. Now, if you're, if you're a sole inventor, that's kind of clear, and you're not working for another company, you're going to own that. And what happens if there's two inventors? Well, if you have two inventors, you're you known as co-inventors, you each own an equal, inseparable right to that invention. So 
one inventor can go out and license it without asking the other inventor. And that can be a big problem, because what value is it if, if I come to you and say, well, yeah, would you like to uh, take a license? And you know that there's another inventor in there who can go out and license it, maybe my competitor for less. So, okay, so knowing that, what can be very important is inventorship agreements. Um, if you are working with another inventor, maybe a very small entity or your, your partnership, let's say you don't have anything <coughs> formally uh, ent entity uh, put together, you can have a simple agreement saying that no one can then license without the uh, approval of the other or other terms that kind of handle that. Um, the other thing, again, if you're working for a company, typically if you're in the area of, that you might be inventing, usually the, you're required to assign all rights to the, uh, to the entity that, or the company that you're working for. That could be you know, through an employment agreement. Um, again, joint development agreements, you know, if your company is working with another company or another institution, it's very important to have that sort of worked out um, early on so that you know, who, you know how you're breaking it up. You know, if we invent something, do we own it? If you invent it, do you own it? Or the other guy owns it? You cross license and all that. Um, so it's, uh, that's important to, to uh, get worked out. Just keep in mind that just because if, if you, let's say you're um, in, in employing someone or you're, you're a consultant you're using, to, to help you come up with something. Maybe not necessarily thinking of invention, but they're coming up help you design your product for you. Just because you pay for it, you may pay a lot of money for it, doesn't mean that you get the rights to it. You know, they may deliver a prototype to you and they may help you design it, but just because you paid them a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean you're not an inventor necessarily because they came up with it. So it would be important before you engage someone like that and, and enter into some sort of a purchase order or a development agreement, that you say, anything you develop on this, I, you have the obligation to sign the rights to me. And that's also going to come up again, even with a lot of areas of intellectual property, especially copyright, where ownership also is a tricky question and very important to get nailed down. Okay, obtaining patent rights. Um, if, if people have had patents, you've probably been through this and, and understand it. If not, let's go through this. Um, one thing is, you know, a patent is, we might, we might sort of know, it, it has to be something new, something that hasn't been out there before. So you come up with this great idea, and you, you know, you're eager to get it patented, to get it protected, but the question is, did someone else already do this? Is it something that, that might be patentable? Well, one thing you can do um, is what's, called, what's called a patentability investigation. So there you can look through the records, let's say, of patents that have issued or applications that have been published and see whether or not is there something out there that's similar or the same to what I'm doing. If you do find something, it can, you know, it can say, well, maybe I might need to spend all this money to get a patent because I'm not going, going to get too far. But what we usually find is, you know, patents are usually incremental improvements over what's already out there. It's, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years, you really have never seen, like, this is a an invention that's completely different and unique. And nothing's ever been done like that. So sometimes you get the results, you might be a little bit discouraged that you know, my idea is, is out there. But usually what happens is inventors come in, they have a, maybe a broader idea of what their invention is. And by seeing that, what, how other people have done it, what it can do is maybe get, you go back to the drawing board and say, well, yeah, okay, my broad idea has been is shown. But I, I can come up with a better way to, to improve, even a better way to improve it. So sometimes getting the results of a patentability search, even if they're not necessarily positive, it can help drive you to focus your idea, focus what your invention really is, and focus where that improvement is. And that can be very helpful then when you go try to get an application on that, because now you're an attorney and, and you are working together to, on that particular aspect. There's also something, as I mentioned earlier, this idea of patent doesn't give you a right to make it or use your product. There's a right to use investigation. Again, it's something where if, before you go down the road of inventing or coming up with something, or you might want to know, well, what other patents are out there? I mean, if I'm going to spend a lot of money on this, developing this product, am I just designing a product that someone else has a patent for and I, I might be able to sell it? So, that's another thing that you can think in mind is whether or not you need a right to use investigation. And those can be, 
it can be, if you look at them very broadly, that can be a very um, detailed and time-consuming and therefore expensive investigation. But maybe you know, if I come out with this invention, there's three companies that I'm going to be taking business from and three companies that are not going to be happy. So maybe I should check those three companies and see what type of patents they have. You know, that way you can focus it down. Because if someone has a patent out there that's maybe, you know, maybe it's in a different field, but they happen to have a claim that might cover you, they're less likely to be a problem. And if they do find you, maybe they'll be more willing to license because you're not really taking core business from them. Okay, so you, you, maybe you've done your investigations. You have to prepare an application. Um, it's, you know, a patent application is a written, a written document. Um, and it, there's two things one over. There's a, a provisional application. Um, as again, not as I said, you want to get an application on file before you disclose. A provisional is a, is a, it's an application. It doesn't get examined, but it puts keeps your get your foot in the door. It, it it will get you a filing so that afterwards, if you disclose it, you're okay. You're not then going to be barred from getting um, a patent on it. So if you clearly and adequately disclose it. But it doesn't have all the requirements. Your drawings could be hand sketches, could be photographs of what you're doing. Um, it doesn't necessarily need claims. You could, or you could have just pre-claims. So that could be a, a, a